In this video, we're going to do a second proof of Wedderburn's theorem. It's important to realize that there are a lot of theorems that can be proved in more than one way, and Wedderburn's is one of them. So I want to start by stating Wedderburn's theorem again. Uh, we want to let D be a finite domain, a finite integral domain, and Wedderburn's theorem says that if I have a finite integral domain, then it turns out that D is a finite field. Now, uh, the proof th that we're going to look at this time starts off by simply writing the, ex the uh, elements of D explicitly. So we're going to let, actually we're going to write the elements of D star explicitly. We're going to let D star be D1, D2, all the way up to, I don't know, let's call it Dn. And we will set D1 equal to the 1 inside our set. And this D star, remember D star is just D take away the 0 of the domain. Um, so it's important to realize that, uh, let's see, that kind of looks a little bit weird, so let's clean up my notation there. And um, so what I want to do is I need to look at an arbitrary element of this set. So we have to pick an arbitrary di inside set d star, and we need to find a multiplicative inverse for this element. So we need to find a multiplicative inverse for di. And uh, the way we're going to do this is as follows. Uh, remember that d star is d1, d2, all the way up to dn. And these are the non-zero elements of, Z, of d. They're the non-zero elements of our domain d. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the set di times d star. Now di times d star will be di times d1, di times d2, and so on all the way up to di times dn. Now it's, reason it's, it's reasonable to realize that it looks like there are n elements. So it looks like there are n elements here. And it's also something that I want to point out. We know that every one of these elements, so I'm also going to point this out, uh, no matter which one I pick, if I look at di times dk, uh, where the k is somewhere between 1 and n, so dk is one of these elements, Well, it's technically one of di times dk. This guy is a product of two non-zero elements inside domain D. And hence, di times dk cannot be equal to the zero inside D. And that says that di times dk is going to be an element of d star. In other words, this set is a subset of d star. So the real question then is as simple as, are there any duplicates? Because if I've got a set of n objects that lives inside of another set of n objects, then one of these guys down here has to be equal to that guy, and will be done. So let's see whether or not this set di times d star can have duplicates. So we're going to look at this question. Does the list, when I write it as di times d star equal to di d1, uh, di d2 all the way up to di dn, does that list have duplicates? Well, let's suppose for a minute that it does. 
So in other words, I'm just going to happen to, let's actually think about this. Let's suppose that di times dk is equal to di times dl. where all I know about dk and dl is that dk and dl are in d star. So again, uh, what this means is that one of these guys is equal to di times dk, and one of these guys is equal to di times dl. And we're simply assuming that they're the same thing. Now, it's important to realize that this equ equation is an equation in domain D. And because it's an equation in domain D, I can subtract the right-hand side off to get di times dk minus di times dl is equal to the zero element of my domain. Of course, now we can factor that di out on that left-hand side. And when we do, we have di times dk minus dl is equal to the zero element inside my domain. Now, this is a really important thing. d is a domain, and hence, if we know that a times b is equal to zero, then we know either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0. And here is a product that is equal to the 0. So what does that say? Since di times dk minus dl is equal to the 0 element and d is an integral domain, we know that either di is equal to 0 or dk minus dl has to equal 0. But I want to remind you, we started out by assuming that di was an arbitrary element of d star, and so this says that did not happen. So what we now have is that dk must equal dl. And so what that says is there are no duplicates on the list of elements for di times d star. And let's think about what that means. So di times d star has elements di times d1, di times d2, all the way up to di times dn. And this is equal to d star. And d star, remember, is d1 times d2 all the way up to dn. And so this literally says this list here is a permutation of this list. So these two lists are permutations of each other. All I did when I went from d star to di star is I rearranged these elements into a different order. Now remember, this element here, d1, was set to be 1 in our, in, inside of our domain. And we have now that d1 has to belong to di times d star. So 1 does belong to di times d star. And what that says is there has to be somebody inside d star so that 
di times dj is equal to that 1 inside di times d star. And that actually is just about the end of the proof. So let's finish it up really, really quickly. Since d is commutative because it is a domain, we know that dj times di is also equal to di times dj. And di times dj, we just got done showing, was equal to the 1. And that's enough to say that di inverse is actually dj. And since we picked an arbitrary i, we know that all elements of d star have multiplicative inverses. And that's enough to say that d is indeed a field. And because d is finite, it is a finite field. And that completes our second proof of Wiederbrunn's theorem.